Christopher Children's Church. And uh, if you have your copy of God's Word, please turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. Well, as the kids make their way out of the sanctuary, I do want to just uh, recognize uh, Miss Judy uh, Farrell and her family. Uh, Miss Judy wanted me to express uh, her thanks to everyone here for her, your kind words and prayers as uh, she said goodbye uh, to Jabbo uh, this past week, especially for those of you who helped prepare the food uh, for uh, the family. I uh, want to exp- expend your um, uh, thanks to them. Uh, we also just want to be praying for uh, John Whitaker. John is uh, not with us this morning. He is preaching at Faith Baptist Church over in Clover, so we'll be praying for him as he's probably standing uh, before that congregation now uh, to preach God's word. Well, anytime we come before the word of the Lord, what we want to do is we want to have hearts ready to receive what God has for us. Uh, And one of the ways that we do that is before we hear the preaching of the word, we stand for the reading of that word. So at this time, please stand for the reading of God's word. Second Kings chapter two, beginning in verse 19. Now the men of the city said to Elisha, behold, the situation of this city is pleasant as my Lord sees, but the water is bad, and the land is unfruitful. He said, Bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been healed to this day, according to the word that Elisha spoke. Amen. Please be seated. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, we uh, come before you now knowing that you delight to hear the prayers of your people. God, we ask you that you would incline your ear to us uh, through the blood of Christ we come. God, we, we do thank you that you have brought Miss Judy here and her family. God, we pray that you would just encourage their hearts this morning, Father. Lord, we pray that in the coming days and weeks, God, you would sustain them again and again by your grace. Uh, we thank you so much, Lord, for Jabbo and his influence in Um, their lives, influence in this city and this church. God, we pray that you would just um, continue to bring fond remembrance, Lord, and sustain and comfort that family. Father, we thank you so much for having uh, John and be talking to him with us again this morning. We thank you so much for uh, seeing positive results from uh, John's treatments. God, we pray that you would just have your hand upon his life. God, we thank you how you have used this uh, cancer to draw him closer to you. God, we pray that you would continue... uh, by your kind mercy, uh, to grow him deeper and deeper in you and to keep him uh, healthy. Father, we also just pray for uh, Patsy Quinton and Olin Hollis, Lord, both facing uh, serious cancer, God. We pray that you and your, and your power, Lord, would just, would just meet them by your grace. Father, we, we ask that you would be with our upcoming Vacation Bible School. Lord, I thank you so much for Jenny and Bobby and their work to prepare for this coming week. God, so much goes into this week and about volunteers and, and resources, God. We pray that you would just give us favor, God. And we know unless you call men and women, boys and girls, unto yourself, we can do nothing. So, God, we pray that as we preach the gospel in song, in, in story, God, in conversation, that you would draw our, our children's hearts to you. God, that you would bring conversion, that you would bring life, God, where there is death. Lord, we, we pray, God, by your mighty hand, that you would, would bring people who are far from you to our church this week, that they may have a, an, an eternal experience, an eternal difference through the blood of Christ. Father, we thank you so much for um, a gospel that, that goes beyond our worlds, beyond our, our boundaries. We, God, we thank you so much for uh, Jennifer Baker and the Dosters going to Indonesia and, and Mexico. God, we, we pray, God, that you would just give them favor as they go. Lord, that you'd allow them to enter into uh, good relationships with people uh, in those lands, God, and they would that, that, that nation to be turned uh, closer and closer to you. We pray that for the churches of both Indonesia and Mexico, God, that they would grow in health, Father, that they would resist false teaching and continue to preach the, the pure, unadulterated gospel of the Lord Christ. Father, we also just come for you now, praying that you would be with other churches in our area. Father, we do pray that you'd be with Faith Baptist this morning as, as our dear brother John Whitaker preaches to them this morning. We pray, God, that he, they would help see the, the praise the praise of your glorious grace, God. That they would see that from before the foundations of the world, you called them to be your people, to be adopted as sons and daughters. We pray that you would mark John's words with truth, God, with humility. 
And God, with power, Father, mold that congregation more and more into your likeness. Father, now as we come to this hour where we hear your word, we pray that you would just speak, Lord. Uh, As I announce your word, I pray that you would preach through me by the power of your Holy Spirit. I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase. God, we know that as we lift high the name of Jesus, you would draw men and women unto yourself. And we ask that you do that now. God, we pray as we we think about Elisha's life and the beginning of his ministry, Father, we pray that we would be convicted about our own leadership and the different spheres of ministry that we have in our homes, at our jobs, in this congregation, among those that we're trying to reach in our neighborhoods. Father, we pray that we would understand that even in the midst of those who, who may doubt us, God, that we can trust in you, that we find our identity in Christ. And God, I pray that we would see that you are the God who brings living water, Lord. You are the God who brings salvation uh, from uh, death, that you bring life where there is none. So God, we pray that even now, Lord, you would bring life for the glory of your great name. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Every leader has to live up to the expectations of their predecessor. Uh, when I uh, came here, I really didn't have to live up to the expectations of only my predecessor uh, before I got here, but really the, 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 the main patriarchal pastor of Park Baptist Church's history, B.F. Hawkins. B.F. Hawkins, pastor from 1944 to, to 1958. And Max Phillips and many others would tell me stories of, of good old B.F. and his love for the Word and his love to preach, preach uh, the gospel of Christ. Uh, But the thing is, is as a pastor, I know that I don't just have to live up to the expectations of the previous pastors of this church. Often I'm going to be judged by your previous experiences of the pastors in your life. Uh, The pastor that you've had growing up, or the pastors you had before you moved into this area. Uh, Every leader must live up to the expectations of the leader that came before. Pastors, presidents, coaches, managers, CEOs... Uh, they ne- we never lead in a, in a vacuum. Every decision, every choice is analyzed, questioned, based on the previous leaders, or on, like I said, your background of your leadership. As we think about um, Elisha and his leadership today, uh, I pray that we would look deep into our own leadership and the spheres that God has given us and, and learn a little bit about uh, what God may be calling us to. Every one of you will be called to lead in some areas of your life. Some may be large corporations. Uh, some may be small areas in the life of our church. Some may just be over your family in your home. But you are going to lead in some way. So this morning, I want to, to, to bring out some of the challenges and the hope that we see in leadership. If you have an outline, I want you to provide, provided you put in the bolts and the one provided for you, there's four things I want you guys to see from our text this morning. The first is the doubt of leadership. The doubt of leadership. As we looked at last week, uh, Elijah was called up to heaven, and Elisha kind of took over the reins. So in chapter 2, verse 15, it reads, Now when the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho saw him, Opposite them, Elisha, they said the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. Remember that they went across on dry land because uh, Elijah parted the seas and parted the the, the Jordan. And when uh, Elisha was coming back after Elijah was taken up, Elisha also came back on dry land. And the, the sons of the prophet would have saw that. And they saw that he was wearing Elijah's cloak. And they said the spirit of Elijah now rests on Elisha. And so they came to meet him and bowed down to the ground before him. And they said to him, Behold, now there are, are your servants, fifty strong men. Please let them go seek your master. It may be that the Spirit of the Lord has caught him up and cast him upon some mountain or into some valley. And he said, You shall not send. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, Send. They sent, therefore, fifty men, and for three days they saw him, but did not find him. And they came back to him while he was staying at Jericho, and he said to them, Did I not say to you, do not go? It's interesting that there's four different groups that Elisha meets right when he becomes 
the, the lead prophet. The first is the sons of prophets. That's probably a guild, a, a group of prophets who are, who are meant to, to bring the, the word to God's, God's people. And even at the beginning, they said that the, the spirit of Elisha rests on Elisha. They bow down before him, honoring his place of leadership. And yet, they were still hesitant to follow him. Even though he was rightly ordained by God to be the, the leader of these group of prophets, to be the lead prophet in, uh, in Israel, in, among Judah, they still were hesitant to follow him. They ignored his words. Uh, when I was in college, uh, I, had, I lived with seven different uh, guys, and uh, any time I came up with an idea of things to do, usually that were really kind of more docile in terms of their opinion, they would say, Keen, your opinion is noted and quickly discarded. <laughs> uh, they would not listen to my ideas of community service and whatnot. Well, that's basically what the, what the sons of the prophets did with Elisha. Elisha, your opinion is noted, uh, but it's quickly discarded. Uh, it wasn't until he was, he said, don't go after uh, looking for Elijah. Why? It's because we know that he's gone. Even in the previous this chapter, all the sons of the prophets said what? You know this is the day that the mass will be taken from over you, be taken away. You know, you know, you know. Three different times it is said, and yet they, they weren't willing to listen. But they pressured him. They pressured him to the point he was ashamed. Then he gave the word, go. Go look for Elijah. They doubted Elisha. But not just doubting Elisha, they doubted God. They doubted that God placed Elijah, Elisha over them. Leaders, friends, should always consider their people in making decisions. But they shouldn't be bullied into making decisions. And I think too many leaders make decisions out of fear of the people. Elisha knew he was right. He knew that Elijah was gone. He saw him taken away with his own eyes, but he was pressured to make a decision that was opposite the one that he felt was, was right. Now, if I add a caveat here, I don't think Elisha sinned here. You know, I, I don't think that it was wrong for him to eventually to allow the sons of the prophets uh, to go looking for Elijah. He knew that they wouldn't find him, and it would only validate his ministry. And yet, what, what he did by, by allowing them to go is he, he allowed them to doubt God. He allowed them to say, yes, you can go and not trust the Lord. Back in the day, maybe a modern day application for us, uh, transition to leadership is hard. I mean, we talked about that last week, this transition, whether it's from uh, a spiritual leader in a church, a job, a new, new principal at your school, a, a, new, a new manager. You know, those first decisions that a new leader makes usually will be doubted. Because they're looking back on what the previous leader, the previous manager would have, have done. So if you're in that role, when you're stepping into a place of leadership, know that maybe the first time you step into to leadership, your decisions will be doubted. That has been proven my experience. The second thing, I, I just want to say that people, natural inclination is to demand that actions um, from their leaders rather than willingness to follow them. I think most people, when they follow leaders, they want leaders to do something for them rather than saying, what do you want me to do? How can I follow? The natural state is to push back against leaders rather than willingly submit to follow them. Beloved, if we want to live out the, the, the biblical principle of humility and godly submission, we need to ask God to give us supernatural hearts. Because it is not natural to submit to authority. And that is in many ways what God is asking us to do, both in our government and in our local church. We don't want to be doubters. We want to be followers. The second thing I see here is the demands of leadership. The demands of, of leadership. So you see this first group, the sons of the prophet, they doubted Elijah, the ones who probably should have trusted him the most. Because they knew that God had called Elisha to be in charge. Well, in, in verse 22, you see another group kind of come to the scene. Uh, the men of the city. Look at verse 19. It says, Now the men of the city said to Elisha, Behold, 
The situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord sees. But the water is bad, and the land is unfruitful. He said, bring me a new bowl and put salt in it. So they brought it to him, and he sprang it out. Uh, and he went to the spring of water and threw salt in it and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water. From now on, neither death nor miscarriage shall come from it. So the water has been healed to this day, according to the word that Elisha spoke. This is the first of Elisha's miracles. It's the healing of water. As you kind of trace through chapter 2 and chapter 3, you see this theme of kind of water kind of woven through these two chapters. Uh, water was the source of life. Uh, the water was bad. The land was unfruitful. Elijah, as we remember from his ministry, had to survive in the midst of the drought. Uh, Elijah's ministry was the whole idea of the drought and the rain. And he had to be fed by the ravens, by the brooks, and then uh, by the widow. Here, Elisha, on the other side of, of Elijah's ministry, is that God is going to use Elijah to bring life where there is death, to bring water where there is dryness. Elisha will bring healing and salvation. Notice what it says, that the people of the men of the city said, listen, the land is unfruitful. Their concern was crops. But what does Elijah, Elisha do? He says, no. This water is healed, so there will be no more death or miscarriage. I'm going to bring abundance, abundant life. The reason why I want to draw this out is because when you look at the difference, as we talked about last week, Elijah, uh, God is, Yahweh is God, and Elisha, God brings salvation. We see that same turn in the New Testament. G Elisha is a precursor, a forerunner, a foreshadowing to the coming Messiah. So that the, the miracles that you see in Elisha's life are the miracles that you will see in Jesus' life. But Elisha is not only a, a foreshadowing, a precursor to the Messiah, he's also a, an example of a disciple. It's a wonderful picture that we can follow Elisha's life. But I love what Elisha does here. Elisha... Uh, does not only fix the problems that the people want, he fixes the problems that they need fixed. If you're going to be a leader, any leader, your job in many ways is going to be fixing problems. Right? Those of you guys who are, who are managers, what happens? Your people come to you, here's my problem, fix it. Okay? And as a manager, your job is to fix the problem. But if you're in the business world, part of your job is not only to fix the problems that come to you, your job is to create systems and, and, and um, uh, plans so that they don't have these kind of problems in the future. To fix the problems before they start. You know, I think that a lot of times people focus on the, the fruit of the behavior, or the fruit of the problem, rather than on the root of what causes that problem. Uh, parents, those of you who have children, you see these behaviors in your kids, you see these roots or these fruits that kind of come out of your children's behaviors. And you need to address that behavior, but you have to ask, what's the root? Why did this, does this behavior happen? And I think if you're going to be a true spiritual leader, you need to look beyond just the problem that's in front of you and ask, why, why and where does that problem come from? What is the root of that problem? You know, there's many of you here that I know deal with a particular pattern of sin in your life. And I think sometimes the reason why you can't overcome that particular pattern of sin is because you're focusing on the, the fruit. You're focusing on the outcome rather than the why behind that. You know, we have to dig deep and get to the root of those problems before we can focus on, on the fruit. That's what a lot of leadership is. See, Elisha healed the water. Elisha does not focus on the fruitlessness, the fruitfulness of the land, but on the life of the people. Now this, land, this water is now healed to bring, will no longer bring death and miscarriage. It will bring life. Can I make an appeal to those of you here? Can I ask you to just really search your heart and maybe ask people around you when you're struggling with someone, if this is the issue that you have in your life, ask why is it there? Where does it come from? Ask other friends and see if they can search out and, and, and help diagnose what's really going on inside your heart. You know, I do a lot of counseling as a pastor. And one of my goals as a pastor uh, is, is to help, find, help people find the, the root of their problems. Because it's usually not what they think. And what do you do? You listen. You ask questions. 
The Bible says a man's soul is deep water. A man of wisdom draws it out. So you need to have godly friends, godly uh, spouses to draw things out of each other to help show what's really going on. So I pray that you would just ask God to reveal to you the root so that you can deal with the fruit. As we see here in the text, I don't think there's anything specific about why this salt is used. Uh, salt can be used for a number of things. I think it's more symbolic. But we do know is that uh, Elisha, they, 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 they came to him with a problem and he fixed the problem. Of course, he went with the Lord and the Lord was the one ultimately to fix the problem. So we see two groups right off the bat. We see the, the sons of the prophets. And then we see the men of the city. The third group, we see a group of young men, which would be our third point, the disrespect of leadership. The disrespect of leadership. Look at verse 23. He went up from there to Bethel. And while he was going up on the way, some small boys came out of the city and jeered at him, saying, Go up, you bald head! Go up, you bald head! And he turned around, and when he saw them, he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And two she-bears came out of the woods and tore forty-two of the boys. From there he went on to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. Now when you first read this story, it sounds a little harsh, right? Uh, the prophet is just going along in the way, and these young boys call him a name, and I'm going to send some she-bears after you, right? It seems a little bit uh, harsh. But let's kind of back up the story here a little bit, okay? It says small boys or young boys. We could probably say they're probably in their teens. Uh, this is, but this is a group of them. It says that only 42 of them were, were mauled. It could be a larger number of, of boys that were there. It was probably a gang. All right? Just think of a, a large gang that was doing what? That they were attacking Elisha. Now, they could have been attacking Elisha because of his appearance. Elisha could have had a bald head. Okay? By, by nature. You know, sometimes God blesses you with a thick head of hair. Sometimes God blesses you with a receding hairline, right? God may have blessed Elisha with a receding hairline, and he was a young man, and they were making fun of him. It could have been where because Elisha uh, was a prophet of the Lord, that he made a vow to the Lord and shaved his head. Listen, I'm going I'm to mark myself off as different, right? That's what the Nazarite vow was. I'm going to mark myself off as different. I'm going to shave my head showing that I belong wholly and totally to the Lord. We don't know. The text doesn't say. But either way, the, the group of young boys were attacking and mocking the prophet of God. And, and this is what I think that when we first read the story, we may kind of be jarred by, is because we don't really understand the nature of sin. We don't really understand the nature of, of disrespect and what's really happening here. The, these group of boys were saying that God's word is not important. That God's word is being maligned and being, and being ridiculed. But the text says that Elisha cursed them in the name of the Lord. He didn't do this on his own. He did this in the name of the Lord. Elisha was justified to punish them of their, of their sins. I don't think that we fully understand um, disrespect for God's authority, disrespect for God's words, and disrespect for God's leaders really is in the eyes of God. I don't think that we fully grasp the gravity in which God approaches that. If you look and read, especially through the Old Testament, about how God's leaders are, are treated. And, and when the people of God treat those leaders with scorn, God brings swift and strong retribution against them. And I think that we don't really understand it in our days because we live in an anti-authority age. <laughs> you know, uh, young people primarily, uh, we, maybe you can see that, um, are naturally have an anti-authority. Right, they kind of grow up trying to buck the system. You know, there's a there's a, a, a verse in um, where is it Deuteronomy that says that uh, a nation. Or it's in Second Chronicles. Sorry, Second Chronicles two thirty five, I believe, um, or right, right right around there. It says that when uh, a nation is full of mockers, God will bring retribution upon the land. And I think if you look at in America, and there's a lot of young people who are just mockers. They're anti-authority. They think that they have the right to speak against those who are in, in power. Anti-authority is a huge problem in the West. I think a couple of ways that we see it is um, it appears that everyone believes they have the right to speak against people. 
And I think that if you look at social media, one of the things that it is kind of birth, it is birth that every single person believes it is their God-given right to rebuke those who are in leadership, whether it's those people in their own church or those people who are in the government. There is an, is an anti-authority that kind of shows itself online. And it's, it's not always pleasing to the Lord. Now you, could, you could disrespect or dis, disagree with someone in an appropriate way. I'm not saying that. We'll get to that here in a second. But I think the problem here is an anti-authority. That authority is bad. We must be careful of it. I think there's also a, a, a kind of movement in, in the West that says that you don't need to submit to leadership at all. Now, that's one of the reasons why a lot of people don't join churches. Uh, we don't join churches because we don't want to be under the authority of, of leadership, under the authority of, of elders and pastors. When God's Word specifically says, submit yourself to pastors, follow leaders, honor those who are over you. The Bible is very clear that way. But there's a movement, right, in the West that says, we're all leaders. But basically, that's a way of saying is, I can be my own leader and not have to listen to anybody. It's, it's a spirit, the spirit of the age that I believe, if I can be so bold, is demonic. An anti-authority spirit is demonic. That's exactly what happened in the garden. Adam and Eve did not choose to listen and respect the word of the Lord. They chose to listen to Satan become wise in their own eyes. These young men were wise in their own eyes. Go up, you bald head. We don't have to listen to your words. We don't have to listen to the messenger of God. It sounds very similar today. We don't need to listen to the messenger of God in his, in his church. And I think like, I can just say this, is that uh, these young men were not expecting the consequence of being mauled by a she -bear. But you, when you sin against God, you can't determine the consequences. God is the one who determines those consequences. So can I make an appeal to you young people, right? Take seriously your life now. The decisions you make when you're, when you're young, when you're 11, 12, 13, 18, 19, 21... They have lifelong ramifications. You may not realize that, but they do, right? And I can, I, can I make an appeal to parents. Can we be diligent to protect our young people? Can we go after our young people in prayer? Can we raise up our kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord? And understand this, when one of us, as a group, as a family of God, Pure Park Baptist Church, if one of us doesn't take things seriously, it's going to affect somebody else in our congregation. It's just going to happen, Right? The, the evil one is out for our kids, and we have to aggressively pursue holiness in their lives so they can become more and more like Christ to, to curb and protect them from some of the consequences of our, of our day. And yet we know that every leader is going to face disrespect. Whether it's your age, decisions you make, your education, you're going to be disrespected. Future elders and deacons here in the church know that you and your decisions are going to be questioned and are going to be attacked. I've been a pastor here for six years. It's been some of the sweetest six years of my life. Uh, but I would be lying to you if I, if I said that I was not slandered or maligned or gossiped about by the people in this church. That doesn't happen all the time. Usually it happens when, when they're drifting from the Lord. And I know that many of you pray for me, so I'm not trying to make that statement. I'm just saying the reality is that if you're going to lead and you're going to make decisions for Christ and push people towards the Lord, people are going to be unhappy. Because we are, we are in a battle not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenly realms. And Satan influences people to do his bidding all the time. So can I just give you a word? You know you're going to be disrespected. You know you're going to be facing criticism. Uh, can I just encourage you to, when, when you are criticized, the first thing you do is listen? That you heed rebuke? Like, read the Proverbs. One of the marks of righteousness is that if you are a righteous person, when someone criticizes you, you listen. You, you take it to your, your inmost part. Why? So you can become more and more like Christ and more obedient to God. One of the things that have helped me when I think about the way I've been criticized is if they only knew how bad I really was. If they only realize how sinister my heart can truly be. But listen, the bottom line is this. 
I have already been condemned. The cross of the Lord Jesus Christ condemns me. When you look at the cross, the cross says, I deserve death for my sin. I deserve to, to perish for all eternity because of my rebellion against God. I am condemned. And at the same time, I'm justified. Because I'm not looking at my own life to, to bring myself merit with God. I'm looking at the life of Jesus Christ. His death on my behalf brings me to God. I love that verse in Romans 8 that says, Who is there to condemn? It is God who justifies. More than that, it is Jesus Christ who died and rose again. So therefore, we are now more than conquerors in Him who loved us. Now, we are, nothing in all of life can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So when people malign me, slander me, disrespect me, that cannot separate me from the love of God that is in Jesus Christ our Lord. Why? It's because it's been paid for by the blood of Christ. So let people malign you. Let people disrespect you. Heed, listen, is there any truth to what they're saying? If there's truth, admit, repent. And if it's lies, go to Christ, who, by the way, was also maligned and also slandered and did not um, return the favor, but what? He entrusted himself to God. There's a great article um, by Alfred Poyer, uh, and he talks about how the cross helps us deal with criticism. Um, I won't go into it uh, deeply, but let me just uh, tell you that um, the way that we deal with criticism is by focusing on Christ. Focusing on what Christ has done for us in the cross. That he loves me enough to spite of my sin. And yet here, in the text, we see ungodly attacks. Ungodly attacks. And, and notice that God is the one who's going to justify his people. God will defend you. So don't worry about defending yourself. God will do that for you. And let, let me just say this, thinking about this ungodly criticism, let me flip it and maybe ask you, do you have a critical spirit? Do you have unwarranted criticism on your leaders to an ungodly point? Maybe instead of of, of, of being critical, you need to look inside your own heart and you need to ask God to forgive you from your sins for how you have been wronging others and maybe have been critical of others. Lastly, the delivery of leadership. The delivery of leadership. Really, we get, we get to this last group and it's no surprise that if Elisha is going to have kind of follow Elijah's ministry, there's going to be kind of a transition to, to being involved with the, the, the elite of the day. Uh, Elijah had ministry among kings, King Ahab and, and Jezebel. And of course, we see Elisha having ministry among the same. We look at chapter 3, verse 1. It says, In the 18th year of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Jer Jeroham, the son of Ahab, became king over Israel and Samaria. And he reigned twelve years and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Though it was not like his father and mother, for he put away the pillar of, of Baal that his father had made. Nevertheless, he clung to the saying of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. He did not depart from it. So Jeho Jer Jeroham took over for his, his dad, King Ahab, and it says that he wasn't as bad as his parents. He didn't actually follow through with a lot of the worship of Baal. He actually took down the pillar of Baal. But what he didn't do is he didn't demand the exclusivity of the worship of Yahweh. He allowed that they could worship Baal and they could worship God. Because of that, he, he, he allowed Israel to sin, the text says. He did not depart from it. We go on in verse 4. It says, Now Meshach, king of Moab, was a sheep breeder, and he had to deliver to the king of Israel 100,000 lambs and the wool of 100,000 rams. But when Ahab died, the king of Moab rebelled against the king of Israel. Uh, Moab was a vassal kingdom to Israel. They had to pay tribute to Israel. And after Ahab died, the king's down. Moab's like, eh, we're not paying this uh, tribute anymore. So King Jeroham marched out of Samaria at that time and mustered all Israel. And he went and sent word to Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. The king of Moab has rebelled against me. 
Will you go with me to battle against Moab? And he said, I will go. I am as you are, my people, as your people, my horses as your horses. Then he said, by which way shall we march? Jeroham answered, by the way of the wilderness of Edom. So the king of Israel went with the king of Judah and the king of Edom. And when they had made a circuitous march of seven days, there was no water for the army or the animals that followed them. Now, Jeroham, the, the king of Israel, said, this is the way we're going to go. We're going to go through uh, the wilderness. Uh, that's the best and fastest way to go there. After seven days, guess what? There's no water. They're in a dry and a parched land. So what do they do? They looked for a prophet. Chapter verse 9, sorry, verse um, 10. Then the king of Israel said, Alas, the Lord has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. And Jehoshaphat said, Is there a, no prophet of the Lord here through whom we may inquire of the Lord? Then one of the king of Israel's servants answered, Elisha, the son of Japhat, is here, who poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. I find it interesting that the first person who kind of uh, asked, where's the prophet, is the king, king, king of Judah, Jehoshaphat. And then the one who answered was a servant of Israel, an unnamed servant that Elisha is here. And notice how they described Elisha. Uh, they said Elisha was the, uh, the one who poured water on Elijah's hands. Do you see how this water is kind of being connected from, from story to to story. Verse 13. And Elisha said to the king of Israel, What have I to do with you? Go to the prophets of your fathers and to the prophets of your mother. But the king of Israel said to him, No, it is the Lord who has called these three kings to give them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts lives, before whom I stand, were it not that I have regards for Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would neither look at you nor see you. But now bring me a musician. And when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him. Very common in, in the Old Testament is when music was played, uh, divine revelation happened. That's why God gave me such a wonderful voice. And he said, thus says the Lord, I will make this dry steam bed full of pools. I will make this dry steam bed full of pools. Now, if you know your, your, your biblical prophecy, that prophecy of, of dry land filled with pools was very common in the prophets. We see that in Isaiah 44, 3. I will pour out water on the thirsty land, streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. He connects those two. He connects this, the pouring of water and the pouring of God's Spirit. Psalm, 130, Psalm 107, 35. He turns a desert into pools of water, a parched land into springs of water. So this is, this is a biblical theme, an imagery of dry land, and God's going to send water. And sending water is, is, is a symbol of God sending salvation. We have to connect those two. So Isaiah 44, 3 does that. It says, I will, I, will send, um, I will send water on the thirsty land. I will pour out my spirit upon your descendants. Look with me in the text. Thus says the Lord, You shall not see wind or rain, but that steam bed shall be filled with water, so that you shall drink, you and your livestock and your animals. This is a light thing in the sight of the Lord. And he also will give the Moabites into your hand. And you shall attack every fortified city and every choice city, and shall ever, if, fell every good tree, and stop up all the springs of water, and ruin every good piece of land, and land of land with stones. The next morning, about the time of the offering of the sacrifice, behold, water came from the direction of Edom, to the country was filled with water. So, just kind of take, take a big picture here. They're in this valley. They're, 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 star, they're, they're thirsty. I don't know about you, but it's been pretty hot here in South Carolina. Right? Imagine going for seven days, living outside in the heat with no air conditioning, without a glass of water. Right? 
They're, they're, they're parched. This is a dry land. And God says, you will see no rain. You will see no wind. But this ground will be full of water. I'm going to do a miraculous act. I'm going to send salvation. Why? Because the name Elisha means God saves. God and only God saves. You can do nothing to bring salvation. You can do nothing to quench your thirst. Only God can do this. This is what Elisha is trying to, to draw out. And that's exactly what happens. Water comes and fills the land. We have to think about even the passage that we just heard read earlier about the Lord Jesus when he was at the well with the Samaritan woman and says that I will give you waters that will roll up to the spring of eternal life. Let me read it to you. John chapter 4. He says, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would ask him that he would have given you living water. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Elisha is showing that God saves by sending water, living water. John chapter 7, the Lord Jesus says, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Revelation 21.6, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give the spring of the water of life without payment. Why? Because there's already been a payment. Jesus Christ has already laid down his life for us was raised from the dead for us so that we could come, that we could come to Christ and drink and forever be satisfied. Revelation twenty two seventeen. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. Now let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty say, Come. Let the one who desires take the water of life without Price. There was nothing that the armies of Israel, Judah, and Edom could have done. There was nothing they could have done. They were completely and totally dependent upon God sending water. Beloved, we can do nothing to earn our salvation. No amount of work, no amount of effort can bring us favor with God. It is only the God who provides water without price, without payment. What we see in Elisha's ministry is that God is the only one who saves. What we see that this same God sends his son, Jesus, or Yeshua, God Saves to be our salvation by giving us the water of life. The question for us this morning, as is the question for every day, is that Jesus has offered you this water. He has offered you living waters that out of, out of our hearts will flow rivers of living water. He's offered that to us. The question is, will we come and drink? Will we come and drink and trust in Christ every day as our only hope for salvation? Because it is God and God alone who saves. So friend, wherever you are at today, if you're in that dry place, that parched land, can I ask you to call out to God and say, send your water. Send your living water without payment. Well up in me eternal life. So that one day, I can be in your presence in heaven. Let's flow the streams of living water. Father, I pray for my, uh, my friends here today. I pray for my, um, my people whom I love. God, I pray that you would help us see that it is only God who saves. That only God sends living water. I pray, God, that you would send living water this morning and living, living water every day in our lives, that we continue to grow and trust in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Well, the way we experience living water is we come to the cross. Uh, we behold the wondrous cross of Christ. Uh, so at this time, let's stand and sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. For them, anything, any specific prayer request? Um, that the communication would be such that the communication won't be a problem. Okay. There's always something of a problem. Yeah. Uh, they're going there to, to reach the, the deaf in, in Mexico, so we want to make sure that the communication is not a problem. And the reason why that is because there's a lot of teaching that happens. They want the gospel to be heard, right? Truly. Let's let's pray for them. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, for Keith and for Sharon and their just love for you, God. We thank you so much how you have called them out of darkness into your wonderful light, God. You have brought them into the kingdom of the beloved Son, where they have redemption and the forgiveness of sins. And now, God, they go as agents of that kingdom to bring about new life. So, God, we pray that as they, as they sign and as they teach and as they, as they travel, God, that you would give new life. God, give people ears truly to hear, Lord, the gospel of Christ. We pray that you would just mark them uh, with your spirit. Give them favor and grace, we pray. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, today at 4 o'clock, we'll be back here to, to kind of get ready for VBS. Uh, all of you, want, want to encourage you again to be praying uh, for us this week as we are, are, are really going after the, the souls of our kids. Then may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Join hands as we sing Family of God.